about 1.2 million candidates in England have just done their exams and are waiting the result. Mm -hmm. Something like 6 million grades will be awarded because obviously most kids do more than one subject. This is GCSE, ASMA. Of those 6 million grades to be awarded, about one quarter will be wrong in the sense we described, not the same as the senior examiner's definitive or true. That's 1.5 million wrong grades about to be awarded in a month's time. There's only 1.2 million candidates. And 1.5 million roll grades is bigger than the number of candidates. So on average, every candidate in the land is going to get one wrong grade without the right of appeal. Welcome to Rethinking Education. Education's critical friend. Dennis Sherwood, welcome to the Rethinking Education podcast. Well, hi there, James, and many thanks for inviting me to be along. I think we're going to have a great conversation today. Yeah, about a really interesting topic about which I know relatively little, and so I'm very much looking forward to, to being educated on this. Um, so we're going to talk about your the work that you've been doing around around exams and the reliability of of exam grades or the unreliability of exam grades. Uh, and you set all of this out in your in your book, Missing the Mark, which, for which the strap line is why so many school exam grades are wrong and how we can get results we can trust. Um, and so we're going to get into that. Just just before we do, very briefly, would you mention just, we, we, and we're going to do the big bio, biographical bit later in this conversation, but can we just do a brief introduction to you, for anyone who isn't familiar with you or your work? So far? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, James. Yeah, I, I, I'm Dennis. Um by profession, I'm an independent uh, management consultant, and I've been doing that for many, many years. Um, and it would have been about 10 years ago I got involved uh, in thinking about a project to do with uh, education. And I've had a significant interest in educational matters in general uh, ever since. And in particular, with a matter which is the subject of today's conversation, which is about the reliability of GCSE, AS and A-level grades which is, in fact, quite quite a problem in my view, and one which very few people know about because it's not well publicised. That's why I wrote the book. Mm, yeah, indeed, yes. So so where did this begin for you? How do, like, what, what's the beginning? If you, if you just treat me as a perfect novice here, like what, what, when did you first become aware that this was, a, that this was an issue and, and why has this become such a central focus for you? Yeah, well, actually, um, that takes us back to 2015, because in late 2015, Ofqual, the regulator of exams uh, now in England, then it was a little bit broader than that, never been Scotland. In 2015, December, in fact, Ofqual went out to consultation to change the rules for the appeals process. Um, and reading the consultation document, a key feature of that was to introduce what they called the reasonableness test or the marking error test, which says that a script can be remarked only if there is a marking error in the original marking, or if that mark was unreasonable. Now that sounds at first sight very, very sensible, but it disguises something really important. And that disguises the fact that different examiners can legitimately give different marks. No one's made a mistake. We all know that. But those different marks, both legitimate, can end up with different grades. And that's a problem. And the change to the rules for appeals, as in the consultation document of 2015, was throwing that away. And that worried me. So I started looking into that a bit harder. That rule change was implemented in May of 2016 and exists to this day. So any young person now who is unhappy with their grade as they will get them for AS and A level on the 17th of August, GCSE on the 24th. If you're unhappy, you get what is called a review of marking. And that review of marking checks that the mark you were given is not unreasonable and not in error. But that's not a remark by a senior examiner, which is what it used to be before 2016. It's a check that the examiner who did the marking didn't make a mistake. That's good, but it still leaves open this 
enormous void of what would have happened if a senior examiner would have marked my script because a senior examiner's mark is designated definitive or true by Ofqual. It's the benchmark of the right grade. And it's perfectly possible, as I'll describe during the course of this conversation, for you to get a mark which is neither definitive nor true, non-definitive or false or wrong without right of appeal. And since that change in 2016, I've been following matters um, and um, kicking up a bit, which is why I wrote the book, because I think this is really, really unfair. It's going to damage a lot of young people in a few weeks' time, as it has damaged young people throughout the 2010s. What's the, what's the extent of this? Like, how, how, how bad a situation are we talking about here? If, James, you are a senior examiner in, say, geography, and let's say that Sam is doing the marking, Sam will go through each of the script questions that Sam is given. There's a mark scheme, which is a guide of how the marking is done, and Sam will allocate maybe six marks out of ten to an answer. Now, from time to time, you, James, as a senior examiner, will have access to Sam's mark. And for every question, there is what is known as a tolerance. And a tolerance is the number of marks that Sam or anyone else might give that particular question, which is different from what the senior examiner's definitive mark is. And that's key quality control. It recognises that Sam and the senior examiner yourself might have different opinions. That happens in everything from strictly come dancing to Olympic diving to, you know, judging art to marking an essay. Yeah. So there is some tolerance in there, but that tolerance has got bounds. And if Sam, the marker, gives a mark which is beyond tolerance... That means that you, the senior examiner, have a word with Sam, brings Sam back online, or takes appropriate action. So the quality control on marking is very, very good, and the examples take a lot of trouble over it. Now, marking errors can appear where even that doesn't happen, and a review of marking as a post-result service that all students can access for a fee, a fee which is refunded if the grade is changed, will trap those marking errors. But what we're talking about here is that Sam, the geography examiner, might be give me six out of ten, but you, James, the senior examiner, might have given me seven out of ten for the exact same answer. Now, that difference between six and seven is within tolerance, so that's fine. Both the six and the seven are legitimate marks. Now, when you aggregate that up for the whole script, it might mean that the script that is actually marked by whoever did the marking comes up with, say, 64 marks. Whereas had a senior examiner marked that entire script, it might have come up with 66. Now, the difference between 64 and 66 isn't that much, and it is within tolerance. There are no marking errors. So both the 66 and the 64 are totally okay as regards the quality of the marking. Now, here's the rub. Much later than when the marking is done, Ofqual set the grade boundaries. So when those scripts are being marked, none of the examiners know where the grade boundaries are in detail. Obviously, they have a feel for what's a top grade and what's a bottom grade, but they don't know. Now, suppose Ofqual set the grade boundaries for GCSO geography that says maybe a grade 7 is all marks from 61 to 70 inclusive. They can do that. If that is the rule, then 64 and 66 both end up with grade 7. That's fine. But suppose that Ofqual set the grade boundary between a 7 and an 8 at 65 marks, which can happen. Right. Now, under that circumstance, the 64 comes out as a grade 7, but the 66 comes out as a grade 8. So which grade is on my certificate? Well, let's suppose it's the 64 grade 7. Now, given that 
possibility that the senior examiner would have given my script 66 marks grade 8. I'm being awarded on my certificate grade 7, which is neither definitive nor true to the use of the language. It's not definitive or false or indeed wrong. Because if he were allowed to be remarked, and if that remark were by a senior examiner, it would be 66 upgraded to grade A. Now, since 2016, that has not been allowed to happen. So even if I were to request a review of marking, I would not be allowed a remark by a senior examiner. And that grade 7, which is the wrong grade, because it's not definitive or true, using, once again, Ofbol's language, stays forever. Now, if this were rare, if this were a very infrequent event, we'd say, well, you know, that's right. Now, what happened, I now know, around 2014-2015, is Ofcom, the regulator, did a huge study of exactly what we're talking about. They took 14 subjects, maths, physics, chemistry, biology, da di da di da geography, English language, English literature, history, 14 subjects, entire cohorts of script, like 250,000 GCSE geography scripts, mm. 800,000 English scripts or whatever, and did double marking. They were marked by an ordinary examiner as normal, as would happen in the real exam, which meant that my geography script would get this mark. And that same script was marked fully by a senior examiner to give the definitive mark and the corresponding definitive grade. So there you had 250,000 or more GCS English scripts, each of which had two marks and two grades. The ordinary examiner's mark and grade and the senior examiner's definitive or true mark and grade. And of course, we're able to compare each of those grade so every script had two grades, and they'd yeah. say, are they the same or different? Now, you might expect two things. You might expect the number of differences to be de minimis, very small. And you might expect the differences to be randomised across subject, because there's no reason to expect that you know, examiners are more slovenly in marking a geography script relative to a biology script. That's not what happened. What happened was actually first published in November 2016 and then updated in November 2018. And Ofqual's report of November 2018 contains the measures of the reliability of grades in 14 subjects as measured as I just described. Whole course, cohort, cohorts and scripts marked twice. How many were the same? How many different? This is in the public domain. It was published in 2018. And it blows your socks in. If you look at maths, the answer is four scripts in every hundred end up with different grades, and 96 out of 100 end up with the same grade. So that means that randomly, this August on the 24th, around 96% of the maths grades will be reliable in the sense of being the same as would have been given had a senior examiner marked the script. However, 4% of grades would have a different non-definitive mark. Now, 4% doesn't sound very much, but that's 4% of 700,000. And 4% of 700,000 makes a hell of a lot of difference to that number of kids that actually ended up with the wrong grade. Mm, it's like 28,000 kids or something. 28,000 kids with the wrong grade. Absolutely right. Fantastic. A for mental arithmetic. Super. Now, if you go down the list of 14 subjects, I won't go through them all, but let me alight on, for example, geography. Very popular subject, geography. The numbers for geography are 65% of kids get the definitive grade for this time, and 35%, one in three geography students, will end up with the wrong grade without right of appeal. If you go to English language, 61% of kids get the right grade, 39% get the wrong grade. Wow. 
if you go to history, 56% of kids get the right grade, 44%, nearly half, get the wrong grade without right of appeal. So you've got a kind of a, a, a sequence of subjects from maths and physics with the most reliable grades down to things like English language, English literature, history with the least reliable grades. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, that's not a surprise because we all know that, you know, marking a history essay is kind of fuzzier and more fluid than marking, you know, a, a, a physics question. And all of this was published in 2018 and has been in the public domain since then. And there are many, many implications of those numbers. Many. Mm. Yeah, it does indeed blow your socks off. But just just to, to go back to the the, the the basic idea, the fact that the, the, the grades are, the, the papers are marked, they're allocated a raw score, and then later on the grades, the grade boundaries are decided. Is it not inevitable that, that this is going to happen if you if you have grade boundaries and you have you know error you know, a margin of error even if it's within the margin of tolerance you know if 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 the grade boundary just happens to fall within that margin of tolerance when you add it up across a whole paper is it not sort of inevitable that there's going to be a degree of error and, and is this is this question about like how much error are we going to accept Okay, um, that's a very important James, uh, question, James. But if I might just say, let's not use the word error. Because if we use the word error, there's a kind of implication that someone's made a mistake and someone is to blame. No one has made any mistakes. Right. The difference between that 64 and 66 is not the fact that one or the other has made an error. It's just the way things are. So I refer to this as fuzziness. Yeah. Because, you know, there is no single mark which is the right answer for an essay. If we went down to multiple choice questions and A-levels became a more sophisticated version of who wants to be a millionaire, okay, there's unambiguous right, wrong. But whilst we've got a policy that says let's allow some free expression, different experts will have different judgments. Yeah. Clustered. So let's talk about fuzziness. And okay. Absolutely right. James, that fuzziness is intrinsic. The problem is that Ofqual does not recognize that when they print certificates. And because they assume that the mark is the mark is the mark, and they map that onto a great scale, the realization that that mark is actually a bit fuzzy is lost. And that does immense damage. So do you think that they should publish grades that are more of a, like, that have an error, an error bar attached in a sense? Let's get away from error. Uh, <laughs> oh yes, <laughs> a hard word. But what would you say? This is this is sort of a yeah a degree of fuzziness. This is like eighty percent likely to be a grade eight. If it's at the if it's at the top end, I, I'm, I'm jumping the gun here. But what like, we'll, we'll get to solutions later. Maybe like what what might be a better way of doing this? Um, there are many many ways in which one can deliver a certificate where what is on the certificate is really reliable and recognizes the fuzziness of what we are talking about and does not penalize kids because if in fact you're given at a level a grade b mm. because you're on the wrong side of that grade boundary as we've just described and you don't get into you know med school or whatever it is because you don't have the yeah, a this does enormous damage and there are many ways whereby what is on the certificate and what you're attributed with recognizes that that fuzziness so that that does not happen and we can get into that a little bit later yeah i mean could you just give an example well while we're on the topic now of like what might that look like on a certificate okay um well the <laughs> the funny thing is and you are sitting down is you use grades because grades were actually invented for this purpose the first use of grades that I've traced was in 1785 at Yale University in the United States, where the professors there recognized that giving someone 64 or 66 was flawed. So they said, why don't we call those, you know, upper seconds or whatever it would have been at university? Because we don't have to split the hair between 64 and 66. So grades were invented to address this problem. 
but with two extra bits. The two extra bits was you make the grade widths pretty wide so that that fuzziness effect gets absorbed within a given grade. The fuzziness issue only kicks in when that fuzziness straddles a grade boundary. If the fuzziness is within a grade width, it doesn't matter. That's why grade width... So if we only had, say, five five grades instead of nine, then there'd be less error because more of, more of those things would fall within the grade boundaries. It makes there sense. would be fewer people given the wrong grade. Yeah. And, 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 and the other thing that Yale did in 1785 was they noticed that if you're close to a grade boundary and this effect kicks in, we need to be a bit more careful. So the team of professors would have got together around the table, they would have looked at the candidate script, and they would have been very wise as to whether it was a first and two one or a two two or whatever. So grades really work under two conditions. When you have broad grade boundaries and when you have wisdom at the edges. Now, not only have both of those things gone, but they've got worse. Because when they introduced 987 in 2017 for GCSE, mm. the grade boundaries got narrower. And as a result of narrowing the grade width, they increased the likelihood that this fussiness effect would occur. So the grades as of 2017, 987, are even more unreliable than they were before 2017 at A star ABC. So one solution might be, especially for GCSE, have much broader grade width, maybe just for a distinction, a merit, a pass, and a try harder, for example, and policing the great boundaries much better. That's one solution. Can you explain that second point, wisdom at the boundaries? What, what does that look like? It means that a team of examiners look at all the scripts where this fuzziness kicks in over the great boundary, and they go through it and come to a collective wise view of, is this this grade or that grade? Mm. Now, that went out of the window because obviously that requires time and resource. Would it be like, so, it's, so even if you went down to four grades, as you would say, there would still be some error, wouldn't there? I have to keep using the word error. There would still be some discrepancies around the boundaries. Why, 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 what's the argument against just like getting rid of grades altogether and giving each kid like a, either a percentage or a rank point along a percentile? Well, I mean, James, that's another very good idea. In fact, in, in the last two chapters of my book, I identify about 14 ways in which grades could be more reliable, of which having wider grade width and wisdom is one. A much easier one is to do exactly as you say. If my script is marked, say, 64, which is the mark, it's very easy to discover what the fuzziness associated with that mark is. Statistically, it's easy to do. I can go into that if you wish. But let's suppose that we established that that mark 64 is, in essence, got a fuzziness of four marks either way. And that means that it'd be most unlikely that any other examiner, senior or otherwise, would give me higher than 68 or lower than 60. So that's the truth. So the certificate says, Dennis Sherwood, GCSE Geography, 64 marks, plus or minus four, or however that might be represented. That's half of the story. That's what the certificate shows. Now, suppose I'm unhappy with that. And supposing I appeal. And supposing that the senior examiner remarks it. And supposing that the senior examiner remarks it 66. Now, in the old days, that would have been a great change. But this time it says 66 is within that 64 plus or minus 4. So by recognising 64 plus or minus 4 anticipates that another examiner, a senior examiner, would be somewhere else within 60 to 68, as indeed 66 is. Mm. So the 66 confirms the originally awarded certificate, 64 plus or minus 4. Now, if that plus or minus four is done statistically correctly, the likelihood that any other remark would be bigger than 68 or less than 60 is very, very small. 
which means that a second opinion would always very nearly confirm the originally awarded grade, which is why they could be trusted and reliable. Only if in those very rare circumstances, if the remark were above 68 or below 60, would the assessment change. So by making those two policy changes, throw away grades, great idea, 64 plus or minus four, and changing the rules for appeals, making appeals available, allowing a remark, and for my mind, for no cost, that's a secure system. Yeah, that's interesting. Because at the moment, you said earlier that at the moment there's a fee. If you want to, if you want to say, I want this paper to be remarked, the, let's say a kid who got straight high grades across the board and then they got like a, a seven in geography and it was like, what's going on here? There's definitely something wrong because I know that I did much better on that exam or it doesn't, it's not in keeping, whatever. So they, they make a strong case. And is it, is it the parents who pay or the, the school? Okay, the, the two things in what you just said. Firstly, you said if the kid wants a remark, that's what everyone wants. You don't get a remark. I'm sorry, James and candidates, the current rules for appeals since 2016 do not allow a remark except under the exceptional circumstance of a marking error. We're not talking about marking errors. We're talking about fuzziness. Well, so how would you know if there'd been a marking error if it hasn't been remarked? The, what the process is, is that when you do a review of marking, it goes back to the exam board, someone checks that the marking scheme has been complied with. It does not say, would a senior examiner have given a different mark? It's a very, very different question. It just says, has anyone done anything wrong, rather than, has this script been given the right mark? And it's a real difference. And if you go on any of the websites of AQA, Pearson, or OCR, they do not say in bold letters, this is not a remark. Because most people expect exactly what you say, Jane. And that does not happen. If you go to the SQA... Is, is, that, what, is that what did happen before 2016? Because that was when I was teaching that you could send a paper back to be remarked. And that was the rule change that they flagged in the consultation of 2015 that I talked about a while ago right. and pushed through on the very important date of the 29th of May 2016, which is a date of some significance. And they did that deliberately. They knew that they would be suppressing this effect because the first report which shows this effect was published in November of 2016 just a few months afterwards. What a coincidence. What, sorry, did you just, just spell this out for me? I'm, I just want to be really clear. What is it that, what's the effect that you say that they suppressed in making that policy change? They do not allow a remark except if there's a marking error. So that means that if my script mark 64 was reviewed, there are no marking errors, my grade seven or whatever it is for geography is confirmed. Had that script been remarked by a senior examiner and given the definitive true mark and definitive true grade, it would have been remarked 66, grade seven, and I would have been upgraded. That is no longer possible. So it is totally possible I see. that kids now will be awarded a grade which is non-definitive, false, whatever words off call want to use, my word is wrong, and not have it corrected in the appeal system. And that's going to happen for 1.5 million scripts this August. Some interesting numbers around this. About 1.2 million candidates in England have just done their exams and are waiting the result. Mm. Something like 6 million grades will be awarded because obviously most kids do more than one subject. This is GCSE, ASNA. Of those six million grades to be awarded, about one quarter will be wrong in the sense we've described, not the same as the senior examiner's definitive or true. That's 1.5 million wrong grades about to be awarded in a month's time. There's only 1.2 million candidates. And 1.5 million wrong grades is bigger than the number of candidates. So on average, every candidate in the land is going to get one wrong grade without the right of appeal. Quite a doozy of a problem, isn't it? 
it's interesting and so and so and of course like you say you know it, i mean so some of those grade errors might be keep using the word error what what would you grade inaccuracies i think the fuzziness but 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 i mean i mean fuzziness is where this sort of fuzziness seems to come earlier in the process we're now talking about a kid who's got a seven when they should have got an eight or a six that's no longer fuzzy because it's sort of it's quite a clearly defined mistake is that it's a it's an inaccurate grade um Long. and yeah. yeah unreliable um and so so yeah to go back to that question that i asked before it, it does seem like there's a there's a there's an element of this which just seems inevitable if you have grades rather than just giving you a raw score then you're going to have this problem and so and, and like you say the problem exists much more in more qualitative um subjects like history and english and so on than it does in in numerical subjects which sort of makes sense so how should we should we start to move into into alternative ways of doing things we can see the the, the, the scale of the problem here um I, i've actually just before we do that james yeah. um let's just make a couple of points about what has been happening over the last several years yeah please do because um, I, I mentioned that the first official publication of these numbers was in 2016 and indeed schools week published a piece the day this was first published in november 2016 with the headline about half of english grades are wrong and that's still available on the web this is november 2016 this is seven years ago and after all sorts of argy bargy long story Ofqual published another report in november 2018 which contains the numbers like 96% of maths grades are reliable, whereas only 56% uh, of history grades are reliable. That was 2018. That's five years ago. So this has been in the public domain for five years. The big question is, why have they not fixed it? Now, one of the reasons they have not fixed it is because Ofqual have been in denial. They do not admit that this problem is on the table and indeed as recently as just two weeks ago on the 13th of july that's just two weeks a day from this uh, video recording there is a select committee in the house of lords now select committees in parliament are really important and that's because off call the regulator is what is known as a non-ministerial department and that means that officially, according to the law, of course, chief regulator, chief executive, is not part of the government's department for education, but independent of that department. So of course, is not part of government. They do not report to the minister. Who do they report to? Answer, parliament. That's in law. Now, parliament is a diffuse body. There's 600 odd. MPs and goodness knows how many in the House of Lords. So in practice, Ofqual and indeed Ofsted, while we're talking about it, are accountable to the select committees in both the Commons and the Lords. Right. Now, in the Lords, on the 13th of July, Nick Gibb was giving evidence. Nick Gibb, the schools minister. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that meeting, one of the lords, Lord Mike Watson of Invergowry, asked Nib Gibb the question, how reliable are grades? I paraphrase and get into the actual words he used about this question. So there was the House of Lords Select Committee asking Nick Gibb, please tell us the truth about what's going on here. You won't believe what happened. Nick Gibb was about to open his mouth and the division bell rang in the Houses of Parliament. And because the Lords had to run out to vote, that meeting was cut short. Nick Gibb was quite literally saved by the division bell. He <laughs> did not answer. He was, in fact, just before they all ran out, asked to give a written answer. But because Parliament is now in recess, that probably won't happen until Parliament comes back in September after the results are out. So the question, are grades reliable, is still hanging there. And that question was asked because on 
two previous select committee meetings, two very important statements were made. Let me just tell you this because it really puts this into context. Mm. I'm going back now to 2020, September 2020. Now, no one needs reminding of the chaos of the algorithm fiasco of 2020. Yeah. Long story, once again, a disaster for all those young people. And indeed, you know, they're the same young people who aren't getting their degrees right now because of the strike. What so a just, terrible thing. Just in case any listeners or viewers do need to be reminded of that, the, the, the mutant algorithm, what, what, could you just give the, the short version of that story? What, what, what happened there? Yeah, well, um, because of the COVID pandemic in 2020, um, in uh, early that year, a decision was taken for the lockdown, closing schools, and therefore kids could not sit exams in the normal way that summer. How do we give kids some recognition and certificates for what they've achieved at GCSE, AS, and AO? The short answer was the government decided that they would use some algorithm, some computer system, which would allocate the grades to the kids. That's what they did. There was then a huge kerfuffle around August, just before the results came out. And what happened was that that algorithm got thrown away and kids were given grades from their teachers' uh, determinations called central system grades. It was a huge disaster. Um, it caused unbelievable anguish. And one of the consequences, for example, was that the boss of Ofcom, the chief regulator of the day, a lady called Sally Collier, resigned. And the Secretary of State for Education, Gavin Williamson, got a knighthood. Both of those were consequences of that particular disaster. That's what happened very briefly in 2020. Right. Thank you. Now, on the 2nd of September, that's a few weeks later, the Commons Education Committee got together to try to have a review of what the, you know, what, what had happened. And there were various witnesses at that. It's a good story looking back at 2020. But one of the people there was a lady called Dame Glenis Stacey, who had just been parachuted in as chief regulator after the departure of Sally Collier. Glynis Stacey being a very experienced lady, having been chief regulator from 2012 to 2016, so she knew all about it. In September 2020, the expectation was things would get back to normal the following year. We weren't expecting another lockdown and all of those things. People were optimistic that exams would come back. So a question was asked on Dame Glynis Stacey about the reliability of the exams that would be expected to happen in the summer of 2021 and thereafter. She is on record as saying grades are reliable to one grade either way. Now, that is the chief regulator of Ofqual, Dame Glenis Stacey, a very knowledgeable, very authoritative lady, saying in evidence to the Common Select Committee that grades are reliable to one grade either way. Please think about that. Everyone listening to this, think about what that means. So if I've got history grade B on my certificate for A-level and I don't get into the university of my choice, or worse, worse maybe, I don't know if it's worse, different, I've got chemistry grade B and I don't get my place at med school because I need an A, Glenn Stacey is saying, well, actually, that B is reliable to one grade either way. It might be a C, but it might be an A. No one knows. And not only that, you can't find out because you can't appeal. So Glenn Stacey is saying that you've got a one grade either way fuzziness of every grade in the system, all subjects, all levels. What is the impact of that on university admissions? Could a student now who doesn't get into med school because they've got two A's and a B and they needed three A's, phone the med school and say, boss of Ofqual says grades are reliable to one grade either way. My B could be an A, may I have my place, please? What's going to happen on the 17th of August? So that's on the record. Wind forward to the Lords Select Committee just a few more weeks ago, the Lords Committee on the 29th of June this year, a month ago. The witness there was Dr. Joe Saxton, the current chief regulator. 
I read exactly the words that she answered to a same question about reliability of grain. These are her exact words. I can assure young people who will receive their grades this summer that they can be relied on, that they will be fair, and the quality assurance around them is as good as it is possible to be. Contrast those two statements made by two chief regulators. Exam grades are reliable to one grade either way. On the one hand, grades this summer can be relied on, they will be fair. Now, I don't get it. Those two statements seem to be in contradiction. And that's the background to the question that Nick Gibb was asked, because his exact question was, you know, Dane Glynis Stacey said this, Joe Saxon said that, are grades reliable to one grade either way or not, is the exact question, and he was saved by the bell. So there's a lot of background to this because Ofball have denied the existence of this, therefore they haven't fixed it. Yeah, interesting. Why do you think there is this denial of the problem? Is it because it's not obvious how to fix it? And is it just... I, 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 wish I knew and I wish Ofball would tell. But what I can say is that we go back to the mid-2010s and we go back to Glynis Station. Glenis Stacey commissioned the work to do all that double marking I talked of. Mm. That work was accomplished between 2014 and 2015. If you go on the web, you will find access to a board meeting of Ofqual on the 18th of November 2015. You will find a paper written by the Director of Strategy of Risk and Research, which says... The research is now complete. We need to make sure that the report we publish does not contain any perverse consequences. Interesting. That's November 2015. December 2016, they go out to consultation to change the rules for appeals to prevent the marking by a senior examiner. That gets approved in May 2016. In November 2016, they publish the first information incomplete that grades are one in four grade years wrong. Grades are unreliable. So you've got that sequence of publicly available information. They do the research in 2014-15. There's a declaration that the research is complete and the report is complete in November 2015. The report is published a year later in 2016, and in the middle of all that, they changed the rules for things. Mm. How do you put that together? I don't know. How do you put that together? What do you think is going on? Reading between the lines. Well, um, it's, you know, I think that's for the uh, select committee to tease out. But actually, why would you make it harder for students to get the grade that is defined by Ofqual as the definitive grade. And what information did Ofqual have in November 2015 at that board meeting when the results that were published then in 2016 and again in 2018 show that about one grade in four is wrong? So before they changed the rule, it, did, it was the case that you could pay for a, re, to, for, for a remark and then yes. say, and the second mark would stand. Yes. And it could go down as well as up. And yep. there was always that caveat. And and my my re, my recollection of that is that it was the parents who would pay that, that schools didn't have a budget for that. And therefore, maybe there was a, you could imagine that there was an unfairness there where wealthier families could just throw money at it and just go, let's just get everything remarked. Oh, look, that, that, that is profoundly true. Poorer families wouldn't be able to afford to do that. So, maybe do you think that they might have been trying to address that that economic disparity, possibly? The way you address the economic disparity is you make it free. Um, you do not distress, you know, address the economic disparity by stopping it from happening. That's very straightforward. But you're absolutely right, James. There was a fee. There still is a fee for review of mark. If that review of marking today discovers an error and the grade is changed, you get the fee refunded. But if you're a state school, you might ask the parent, but many parents can't afford it. And of course, 
if schools have to pay for it themselves, their budgets are totally constrained. So there's a huge, huge, huge barrier yeah. to um, equality um, now as there was before 2016 as well. Do you know how much it is for a review of marking? I, I forgot. I think it's, uh, well, well, I can't remember what the number is. It's, it's 60, 70 pounds-ish, I think. It's on the websites. It's about the same number for all um, uh, all, all the exam boards plus or minus all. And would that just be for one for one student to have one paper reviewed? Uh, yes, I think it is. It is you know per per uh, you know per review. Yeah. So it's uh, yeah. So it sounds expensive. Well, I mean, for, for any school, you know, if you've got you know students who are unhappy with their grades and, and want it reviewed, it's a huge disincentive. And of course, that review, let me emphasize, is not a remark. And yeah. the difference between a remark and checking for a parking error in this context is absolutely profound. E, yeah. So, so, so in the spirit of rethinking education, can, can, we, can we move to that, to the second part of the strap line of your, of your book, which is how to get results we can trust. Yeah. Can we explore some of those ideas as to how we could address this situation. Yeah. Well, um, as I say, the, the book has got 14 of them. Um, and we've already discussed a couple. Um, mm. One is, you know, fewer grades, which are much broader, plus wisdom of the great boundaries. Mm -hmm. Another one is to say, you know, it's, you know, 66 marks plus or minus four or whatever it might be. Um, everyone now is talking about artificial intelligence. Um, in principle, that could work because the fundamental problem here is that different experts have different opinions. If there was only one examiner for any subject, and assuming that examiner doesn't get tired or ratty, then that examiner would exercise exactly the same student, uh, exactly the same standards for every paper. So the effect would disappear because everyone is being marked by the one senior examiner. Now, that does happen for some of um, the um, modern languages with very few candidates. If there are 20 candidates doing a particular, um, you know, uh, modern language, uh, maybe one of the Asian or African languages, one examiner can mark 20 scripts and get the same standard. With 700,000 English language scripts, you can't do that. You'd get very tired marking 700,000 scripts. So you have to delegate it to other people. Now, in principle, AI becomes that single examiner because an AI algorithm could, in principle, mark 700,000 scripts without getting tired, without getting ratty. Mm. And I suspect that in the course of time that will happen. But for that to happen, two things need to be in place, at least. One, you, I, and everyone has to trust that algorithm as being wise. And that's a big ask. The other thing you need to do is to make sure that the OCR engine and the AQA engine and the Pearson at Excel engine give absolutely identical results all the time to all candidates. So that that works. And until that happens, that's going to be a while. But in principle, it's there in the future. Mm. Another way is to totally change the structure of exams and that's basically boiling everything down to an ambiguous multiple choice and the educational you know experts have been talking about that for many years that means that there is no ambiguity there's no fuzziness in the answers it's either right or wrong we're back to who wants to be a millionaire but that's got all sorts of consequences as well but in principle that is a solution and there's a solution that looks a bit like that, but isn't quite as harsh sounding. And that is to narrow the mark scheme so tightly and to reduce the questions rather than 20 mark essays to five mark sound bites so that that flexibility or range of opportunity for a student to express themselves is so constrained that it comes to multiple choice by stealth. And I'm very wary of the policy makers that are going down those sorts of avenues. I go back to saying, let's have the ideals of self-expression and indeed of uh, literacy, if not oracy. I'm a great believer in client for exams, another subject to talk about. But give students self-expression, accept that different examiners 
can give different marks totally legitimately. That's what Fuzzy Missile is all about. Don't hide it. Put it on the certificate. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. As a final thing on this, um, like let, let's let's pick up on what you just said about Oracy because you, you would have seen recently Keir Starmer's um, announcement that that if uh, Labour get into power at the next election, that they would um, place. I don't know exactly what the language was, but they, they were like, "We're going to place Oracy at the heart of our mission to transform education" or something. It probably sounds quite woolly, but essentially they're putting Oracy on the map. And we were just speaking off before we started recording, weren't we, about about the the, the reason that like, why is it that oracy the word was invented in the nineteen sixties in an attempt to give spoken language the same sort of status as is afforded to written literacy and numeracy, and for a whole range of reasons that hasn't happened in the interim, and reading and writing still very much rule the roost in terms of what happens on a day to day hour to hour basis in schools. And I think that one of the reasons that that it hasn't happened is that oracy is it doesn't leave a paper trail. It's ephemeral. It dip, disappears. It's subjective. It's complicated. It's interactive, right? So like you know, no two conversations are alike. Um, and be, because it's hard to measure, um, then it is you know I think people you know a while ago the spoken language element was taken out of the English GCSE, wasn't it? essentially for that reason because they said well it's just it's hard to do it accurately and so let's just stop trying um what do you think about about the the idea that we could that we could have written uh, a big about an oral vivas um as a part of assessment and and how does that how does that feed into this reliability thing because it seems like that's super fuzzy um james uh what a rich question and um you know, the, the whole thing about oracy is it's all the things you mentioned, but it's one other thing too. It's natural. It's what we do. In fact, the artificial thing to do is to write. Yeah. Uh, you know, I had to learn to write at school, whereas, you know, speaking is something that was a natural gift of, you know, not just humans, but, you know, communication through sound uh, is you know, with many animals too. It's what humans naturally do. And talking to one another, being clear, is going to transcend all AI. We will always do that. So to my mind, oracy is absolutely at the heart of being a human being, and we should all gain confidence and confidence in clear articulation of what we're talking about. You then said, and correctly, that because it was too difficult to assess, we went away from it. Well, if that isn't a tail wagging a dog, I don't know what is. Because the solution is to say, how do we encourage oracy and solve the problem and assess them? And you're right, it is fuzzy. But if we recognise that fuzziness exists, we do a couple of things. Firstly, we accept it. And secondly, we actually have some people around whom we trust to be reasonably wise. And let me give you a very concrete example. My wife. My wife is Danish. She went through the Danish education system you know, umpteen years ago in the 60s or whenever she and I both were of that age. And she cannot understand one word of what this conversation is all about because the English exam system is so bizarre in her eyes. When she was about 18, doing the equivalent of A-levels in Denmark, she had studied about eight subjects. About the March of the final year, she was told which five she would be given a teacher assessment on and which three she would be examined on. So they weren't examined formally like we are in all eight subjects. Teacher assessments were trusted for five and they were examined three. Her combination of three was different from peers in the class so that, you know, they were paying the randomness. What would, did the exam look like? Nine o'clock, she goes into a room. She is given the exam paper to look at and to study. 10 o'clock, she goes into the second room where she has a viva. And the viva is by her own class teacher and by an external examiner. The viva focuses in on the script, on the question that she'd had one hour's sight of in advance and have a conversation about. And she gets the grade before she leaves the room. The Danish system 
still does that according to the information I have from you know, cousins and the family over there. Now, that works. And, you know, the Danes are still the Danes and they have quite a nice society. So that is an example of getting that to work because they trust the people. Mm. If we trusted teachers a bit more, if people were trained and feeling confident in that, and I think very importantly for teachers, if they expect the responsibility from them, one of the features of the exam system right now is a teacher can legitimately say, your grade, a student, is not anything to do with me. It's done by those people over there. So to a certain extent, they can detach themselves from it. If we go to something a bit like I've just described, teachers are taking more of a responsibility for their judgment as their pupils, not wholly, but that's taking a burden on their shoulders. And I can understand the reason why teachers may say, well, let's not go there, let's keep the system that exists because I don't want to take that on my shoulders. I could understand that, but I think that's one of the issues to manage. Really interesting. So, so, so if there's one thing that that um, that you would like to see change, what would it be? Okay, um, I'm going to cheat a little bit. Um, magic wand now, today. Today is a decision by Ofqual, today, to say that every exam certificate being printed on the 24th and the 17th of August has at the bottom, in bold letters, Ofqual warning the grades on this certificate are only reliable to one grade either way. They could do that today. That could happen in four weeks' time, so that at least everyone knows. And that means people don't take decisions, which are saying, you know, all B is bad, all A is good. Yeah. Life is more subtle than that. That would be my magic wand for this moment. Mm. Magic wand a little bit down the road is that an independent panel, independent of DFE, independent in Paul Neil Vofkall, of people who are really wise and trusted, to answer the question that you articulated. Let's have a look at assessment. Let's identify all the possible ways in which assessments, based on exams as we have them at the moment, are carried out, which include the ones we've talked about and many others. Let us define some criteria of goodness and badness, recognising nothing is perfect, and let us determine the one which actually gives the best possible answer, taking into account reliability, costs, practicality, those things. Yeah. So this problem is solved. Magic one number three is much longer term, which is saying, well, you know, can, how do we reform the whole educational system of which is, this is just one small part? But those would be my Indeed. three ones. Yeah, I like it. I like it. And the fact that it's magic means you can wave it as many times as you like. And I like, I like how you subverted that question. So there's so much more that I would like to ask you about, about assessment, because it's just such a massive and hugely important topic. Um, but we're going to draw a line under it for now, if we may, because I would like to ask you about yourself and your own experience of education. What kind of school did you go to? What kind of a student were you? And, and the story of your later education. And, and also, as, as, as a, as a, I might as well just say this now, as a, as a second sort of ele element of this, what, one thing that I'm really interested in is in so-called significant learning, what Carl Rogers called significant learning, the learning that really counts, the learning that, that, would we, that changes us in some way, the learning that shapes us as people, as thinkers, that shapes our career, our lives. And that might be a book that you read or a person you met or something. So I know this is a hugely expansive question. So firstly, starting with um, your experience of school and then take us through to, to the present day. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, uh, going way back when, um, I was born in uh, Leon C, uh, just near South End on in Essex. Mm. Uh, I went to Lee North Street Primary School and Westcliff High School for Boys. Um, Westcliff still exists there to this day. Um, and, uh, you know, I, that, that was a good experience. I, I had a uh, happy childhood. Uh, I enjoyed school. Um, I vividly remember um, my Latin teacher in particular. I vividly remember my English teacher to whom I owe very much in terms of, you know, being able to express myself. And I also remember my maths teacher. Um, and I remember him for the reason where 
every lesson he started, he started with saying, don't write anything down. And this was, you know, when people were writing all chalk on boards and you took your own notes, there were no other notes. And he said, listen to what I'm saying and pay attention. And then we can write it down. And I think that, you know, listen and pay attention is such a good learning um, principle um, that, uh, you know, I, I really value what he said. Because, you know, otherwise you spend all your time writing and you're not listening. Yeah. Um, so after that, um, read Natural Science in um, Clay College in Cambridge, um, ending up with um, a degree part two physics. At that time, I was very much interested in being a research scientist. So I uh, went to um, Yale University in the States to do a master's degree. And then the supervisor I had got a position at the University of California in San Diego. So I went out with him and got um, a PhD in biology from um, UCSD. That was 1974, in fact. Um, I was married um, to my Danish wife by then. We met at Yale. Um, we wanted to live in Europe, so we came back to Brighton, in fact, where I had a postdoctoral position in molecular sciences in Brighton, and Annie uh, did an undergraduate degree there in economics. And then I had, um, you know, one of these uh, kind of quite dramatic moments where I decided no longer do I wish to be um, an academic scientist, but, you know, what on earth do you do with a PhD in, in fact, biophysics? is what it was. Um, but in 1974, um, very different from today's world, it was quite easy to find a job, even with a PhD in biophysics. So um, I then went into consultancy and got a job with the Deloitte consulting firm as a junior. Um, stayed there, became a partner there, was a partner there for a dozen years, then moved on. Uh, I worked at Goldman Sachs um, for a while. I then became the managing director of um, Stanford Research Institute's operations in the UK, which is a spin out from Stanford in the US, and then set up my own consulting business about 20 years ago. So that's potted biography. But in mm. terms of learning moments, um, going way back when, um, learn how to listen, my maths teacher material. My English teacher, in giving me confidence in the written word, um, that was very valuable, and I've done a lot of writing. I've, I've written 15 books, and that's really attributable to his teaching. But there was something else that happened as well, um, which was a bit of a, a light bulb moment, to use that metaphor, just relatively recently, um, and that's about creativity. My real interest is in creativity, how to have ideas. And for many, many years, I believe that creativity was an act of luck you had that strike of lightning you had the eureka moment and if you were a creative person that might happen rather more often than if you were an ordinary person um, but around the uh, 1990s i started thinking about that quite hard and did a lot of reading and discovered that that was not the case you can make creativity deliberate and systematic you can sit down with a group of ordinary people in an afternoon and have the most wonderful ideas if you think about things in the right way. So that was a real learning moment for me because during my entire education from school through to PhD, no one, no one, no one told me how to think. I became very good at solving problems that other people had solved before that I had read about in books or been taught in lectures. And because I could replicate that, I did quite well in conventional exams. But when I had to think for myself, I got stuck. And I got stuck and I got stuck and I got stuck until either I ignored it or was lucky or someone else told me the answer. Bad place to be. We need to learn to think for ourselves, which is why my real passion right now is about creativity. And I'm a great advocate of teaching young people at schools how to think for themselves, which is ultimately what creativity is about, which is the generation of ideas. And I distinguish that from the evaluation of those ideas. You know, are those ideas interesting or not? What does a good idea look like as opposed to how do you have the idea? Those are hugely important life skills 
which I really believe should be incorporated in the curriculum. And indeed, with all the reform movements, rethinking assessment, Times Education Commission, all of that stuff, creativity is now recognised as something very important. And Bill Lucas, in particular, uh, University of Winchester, is a big advocate. Yes, indeed. I've worked quite closely recently with um, Professor Louise Stoll, who yeah. has just written a really good book with Bill, um, a creativity toolkit for school leaders. Yeah. Very, very good. Um, right. Fascinating. What a really interesting um, account of your of your life. Thank you for sharing that. Creativity is a really interesting, so it's sort of it's like quite a hot button issue in, in, in the education debate. Because there's there is a sort of there's been a bit of a sense that like in the past that that you can sort of that you can teach creativity in a sort of in a it's almost as like a character trait that we can that we can teach people to be creative people, but other people like like part of the part of the rationale for the shift that we've seen um, under the under the government for the last twelve years or so in England uh, the shift towards a knowledge rich curriculum. Is partly justified by the claim that in order to be able to think creatively about something, the first thing is that you need to know a lot about that thing. You know, to like you know a lot about assessment and you can think creatively about how we might do it better. You know, but but I'm I'm less able to do that because I don't know as much about assessment as you. I haven't done all of the reading that you've done. Likewise, if you want to. Yeah, if you want to fix the, the toilet, anything, right? You, you need to be knowledgeable. And, and that's how, that's the, largely the justification. People who advocate this traditionalist sort of knowledge-rich approach, they sort of say, yes, we want to create creative, collaborative people, but the, but the way that you get there is that you make them very knowledgeable and then they can apply that knowledge later on. And so their, their, their case is that the, the means are not the same as the ends. The argument is that the, the the end is to create creative people, but the means is the knowledge-rich curriculum. What would be your answer to that? Okay, um, I, I, James, I, I'm, I'm familiar in general with what you're talking about, and I think actually what you describe um, is harsher in reality than your description. Because I think the division that you address between knowledge on the one hand and creativity on the other is associated with a time sequence that we have to fill all these kids with knowledge first and somewhere down the road as a consequence of that creativity happens mm. and that i think is the pernicious bit my own view is that knowledge and creative material an interlinked continuum um, if you take for example um, an artist if an artist does not have any knowledge of red paint and does not have access to red paint, very hard for that artist to deploy red paint in a painting. That's a very trivial example of the fact that some degree of knowledge actually helps creativity. To my mind, they are a continuum, and I certainly believe that the more knowledge you have, the richer the foundation that you have to be creative, because to me, creativity is not the discovery of something new. That to me is very important. If it's new, that might be nice, but it's not a necessary condition. The necessary condition for creativity is something different from what is now. And there's a huge difference between the discovery of new and the discovery of different. To be honest, I don't know what new looks like because I don't have enough knowledge of what's out there. So if I think of something, I have no idea whether it's new or not. That's a huge barrier in conversation, because if you ask me for a new idea, I'm scared to say something, because it might not be new to, to you, even if it is to me. If you say what's different, that's a lot easier, because we can both observe what happens now, which is knowledge, and we just say, how might that be different? And that takes you to a new place. Trivial example, if you and I wanted to invent a new chocolate bar based on Kit Kat, we would look at the existing Kit Kat and say, ah, oh, it's chocolate, it's got a biscuit in it, and it's four fingers. How might that be different? Well, it might not have chocolate. That's not a chocolate bar. It might not have the biscuit. Well, okay, that's Cadbury's Dairy Milk or whatever. Ah, it might be one finger, a big fat one. That's Kit Kat Chunky. Mm -hmm. So we've just invented Kit Kat Chunky. They should have circular ones, like concentric circles. There you go. There you go. Phone up Nestle 
give them that idea and get the royalty. That's what creativity is. Creativity is saying, how might what we do now be different? Now, what we do now is basically knowledge-based. If I don't know what we do now, we can't be creative about it. As you indeed yourself in a very gentle way said, if you knew more about assessment, you could be more creative about it. So knowledge and creativity go together. But because they go together, they evolve together. So it's not you get the knowledge first and then you're creative later. Mm. We design the curriculum, which is different in different subjects, so that they co-evolve. And it is true that if you want to be creative in physics, you need to know more about physics than if you want to be creative, say, in music. And does creativity feature in your thinking as a management consultant as well? All the time. Everything I do is about saying, how can we be different from what we're doing now, which is all the work that I do. I've done a lot of work in schools, applying that, and the universities, and indeed in commercial operations too. And, um, you know, I, I mentioned I've written, uh, you know, 15 books. Yeah, I was going to ask Marvel about those. Is, you know, obviously the one on them there, but if you give me just a minute. Yeah. This one here, which was published last uh, oh, right. yeah. October, called Creativity for Scientists and Engineers. Uh -huh. It's published by the Institute of Physics, and it sounds a bit heavy, but actually any A-level student very very suitable for how to be creative as a scientist and as you can see from the flash the book won the um specialist business book of the year award just a few months ago mm. and it's a look out how to be creative but with a scientific flavor and telling scientific stories right fascinating what have some of, some of your other books been about uh, okay, I've written about half a dozen on creativity with various flavours. There's another book called um, Creativity for the Mathematical Sciences, in fact, which I've co-authored with um, Professor Nick Hyam, who's a maths professor at the University of Manchester. Um, I've written all sorts of books on other subjects like systems thinking, another hugely important skill for young people, mm. how to see the world as connected. Um, I've written books on financial modelling, I've written books on thermodynamics, I've written books on X-ray <laughs> crystallography, quite a few things over the years. Amazing. Thank you for that. That's really interesting. And so, so so let's circle back to to rethinking education, the, yeah. the, sort of the purpose of this podcast. Um, at this point, we'll look at three questions. And you might want to want to make this about assessment, or you might make it about something else. It's up to you how you how you wish to interpret it. And the, the three questions are positives, challenges, and fixes. So firstly, what are the positives? What do you what do you like the look of as you, as you survey the educational landscape? What do you think we're getting right currently? Okay, I th I think one of the really important and positive things is the pressure for reform. And there have been, over the last couple of years in particular, all sorts of different groups, all converging, primarily in the same, uh, you know, focus, but with slight differences. The Times Education Commission, you know, had, you know, some very, very influential people pushing for reform. The Rethinking Assessment Community, New Era Education. There's lots and lots of communities now saying we really, really need to reform the curriculum, the manner of assessment, the way we actually bring young people to be citizens of the mid-21st century. And I think that is extremely positive happening now because it means there's a broad consensus, ever broader, that we need to do something differently. We need to be creative doing something differently from what we're doing now. And many, many powerful ideas on the table. I do hope they can kind of coalesce into one place because the opponents of that can find it very easy to kind of divide and conquer. Yeah. So if these communities come together and say this is a unified view, it will be more powerful. Absolutely. And the, the problem then is that is that people on the progressive side of education, as it, as in on the progressive side of politics, sort of have a tendency to endlessly splinter into diff slightly different interest groups and and that that sort of coalescing herding cats operation is is easier said than done. But I I, I absolutely agree with you that um, 
that there's no shortage of of people like the the Fed is another organization that's um, doing some really interesting work around advocating for a long term plan for education. This little movement that we've started around this podcast and the conferences uh, at which you're speaking soon, the the Rethinking Education Conference, uh, another good example of a bunch of people coming together with really interesting ideas. One thing that I'm interested in is is the, is the idea of just trying to straddle the divide because I, th- I think that the people tend as as in politics you know the, the progressive traditionalist divide in education very closely sort of echoes the progressive conservative divide in politics and you, of course you need both like progressive in education people tend to think of it as just like oh it's just sort of like holistic and the kids can do what they want and it's all open-ended inquiry and stuff and it's a bit of a caricature and likewise, traditionalist education is seen as this sort of very austere. And we need both of those. We need both traditional elements. We're not saying that we need to throw everything away. And there was a really interesting book that came out back in the 70s, Postman and Weingartner, a book called Teaching as a Subversive Activity. Um, and then they wrote another book a couple of years later, which is less well known, which I think is called something like Teaching as a as a Conservative Activity or as a Traditionalist or as a... As a maintaining thing it's like keeping elements of of what is working well but obviously trying to do things better as well and it seems like it's obvious that we should always be trying to do things better and so the 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 progressive ideal is never going to go away but because things very quickly become sort of caricatured and and things are a bit tribal and people sort of identify with with certain ideas that people identify as a traditionalist in in educational matters um, and that's a problem because it leads to a sort of an ossification and like a rigidity in the debate. And it's just like we need to have an embracing of, of, of recognition that we need to have a you know, combination of keeping what's working and also trying to push the boundaries and to make things better. And it's really obvious that things aren't working. <laughs> as well as they might and pose you know the 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 work that you've done and i thank you for it the, the work that you've done around highlighting the issues around exams and reliability is fascinating that's only one aspect of, of assessment that's that's problematic the, the the degree of absenteeism that we're seeing post covid is absolutely unbelievable we, we talk about this in almost every episode because it's just so huge 1.7 million kids who are persistent absentees from school um, there's so many other issues. Recruitment and retention is in eternal crisis. Ofsted also is, you know, not in good shape. And their recent tweaks, while welcome, are not addressing the fundamental problems that they are causing across the system. Uh, there's so many reasons. There's, the, the evidence is clear that they, the the system, the vital signs, are not looking healthy. And of course, we need to progress things. <laughs> So it's it's interesting that we need to. I think that 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 thing that you were talking about about bringing people together. It's not only about bringing people together on the progressive side of the aisle, if you like. It's about bringing everybody together um, from a very sort of ossified, tribal, you know, divided starting point. So it's 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 no mean feat, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, much wisdom and insight in, in what you say there. James, and I think the complexity that you uh, address there is one of the big reasons why those who want to perpetuate the status quo can very easily say, it's all too complicated, we're never going to do that, why rock the boat, let's stay where we are. It's a very, very powerful um, reasoning that people can use not to change. It's appealing, isn't it? The black and whiteness of it is is appealing in in a very muddy, fuzzy world. Yeah, um, but I think you know, to my mind, there are some very important ways through the complexity that you just you know scratch the surface of, um, and I think there are you know uh, maybe three conditions that need to be in place to make progress, which is kind of looking ahead a bit, and. Um, one thing you didn't mention but alluded to was the power disparity. You know, who has got the power to do any of this stuff? Well, to a certain extent, independent schools can row their own uh, canoes to an extent, 
that they can't do it totally because they're still kind of overall constrained, but their kids are going into universities and a few universities saying, you know, we need A-levels. They're obliged to teach A-levels even if they don't want to, as it were. Um, the real power lies in very, very few hands. You know, it, it's the kind of Nick Gibbs, um, the Michael Goves in Parliament. They've got the power. And if you look at what Michael Gove pushed through a decade or so ago and the repercussions of that, um, you know, he did that because he had the power. Now, at the moment, power is undoubtedly with the status quo maintainers in a big way mm -hmm. and has been like that for what, a decade and will continue to be like that certainly until the next election. Now, if the next election returns a different government, for example, Labour, um, Keir Starmer made his statement uh, just a few days ago. Bridget Tillerson has made many statements as well. But there will be a power change at DfE. And I also would imagine that the select committees will change their structures as well and the nature of their membership, and they too will have an influence. So what will the new power brokers do? Now, I live in a world which is highly pragmatic. You know, although that nirvana might be beautiful, we are actually here, and you can't actually have any number of earthquakes disrupting even more the lives of the young people. So any change has to be gradual, which takes me to two places. One place is a really, really long-term vision of what we are wanting to move to over maybe 20 or 30 years. Without that, you know, it's all just a random move. Mm -hmm. However, 20, 30 years is a long time out, so we need to have a much more pragmatic view of what we can sensibly do this year, next year, the year after, so that everything is gradual, everything is done in a very sensible, pragmatic and wise way, bringing everyone on board, but if we follow the sequence of steps, we're tracking in that long-term direction. I think there's a real big break point, a real big break point about anything which requires the reskilling, retraining, or the different role in teachers than anything that doesn't. So something that doesn't require a change in the role of teachers is something like scrapping GCSE. There's a lot of talk about saying, why do we need GCSE at all at age 16? Because pretty well every kid stays on beyond that. We might need some kind of way marker, but that doesn't have to be GCSE exams. So you could, in principle, scrap GCSE sooner rather than later. If we move to, say, something about assessment, and that assessment is much more about teachers getting involved, I think that changes the role of teachers. If we're talking about a different curriculum, teachers need to be retrained. That's a much bigger deal. That must come later, but we can start planning it. So power, plans, and pragmatism, put those together, you can be in a good place. Mm, yeah, fascinating. I really like your thinking, Dennis. Thank um, you. I've got a lot I can learn from you, I think. So so let's go to the next one, which is challenges. I know we've sort of touched upon a few of them in that bit of the conversation, but if you had to say the number one thing that we need to fix, and this could be educationally, this could be globally, take it, take it at whichever level you wish but it's you know obviously we're here talking about education um what what do you see as the biggest challenge that we need to face well the biggest obstacle is is i think as i've just mentioned you know the power at the moment power is in the hands of people who don't want reform at all as i understand it people who are in essence maintaining the status quo and blocking reform and despite you know the kind of pressure groups and lobby groups that we've talked about you know, the Rethinking Assessment and the Times Education Commission have got some really big hitters on them. They're not being listened to. So we need to change the power base. Mm. Once that is done, and if there's a bit of listening and some wisdom in there, things can move forward. That's such an interesting response, and it's so absolutely on the money. Of course, it's clearly it's clearly the issue. You can have all of the brilliant people with all of the brilliant ideas, but if the people in power aren't paying attention or if they're using their power to go in a different direction, then that's the issue. And so then the third question, which is, you know, linked to that is how do we, how do we do that? How do we shift that 
that power imbalance? How do we broaden it? How do we bring more voices in? What do you think it is that needs to happen and how might that happen? Yeah, well, um, you know, if, if the current government continues, um, nothing will change and, you know, we can shout till the cows come home and the cows won't come home. Um, there has to be a change in government for anything to happen. And, you know, it is more likely, in my personal view, that that will be a Labour government rather than Lib Dem. However, in my view, Labour and Lib Dem have got quite a lot of overlap. I would have thought they would be very good now for um, the Labour and Lib Dem education people to be in on this kind of conversation and to see if they believe that some of the reforms that are being talked about actually make sense and that they can provide the governmental policy framework to give space for it to happen sensibly. Mm -hmm. Then need some very wise people to get together to think of that sensible long-term view. That second bit I don't think is so difficult because there are plenty of wise people out there, but actually it's that kind of um, you know bickering between the experts of, you know, I'm a bigger expert than you are, and we should, you know, do this form of assessment rather than that form of assessment. And that kind of counterproductive argument, we need bigger picture stuff right now. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting. I was speaking with somebody recently who's a who's a head teacher of a very high-performing sixth-form college, um, and he was in a meeting with, with uh, the Secretary of State for Education, and they were talking about BTEX, and she was expressing her dislike of them. And he he was he went to say something, and she said something like, "Are you going to speak in defence of BTEX?" And he said, "Well, yes, I am." And she was like, "Well, I don't want to hear it. They're unfair. Employers hate them. Kids hate them, or something." And he was like, "But I, I could I could counter each one of those three claims." But it was such so clearly a power play. It was really interesting. It was just like putting your hand up and just saying, "I'm just not going to even." ask you for your expert opinion why he was why he, this person was invited um if, if that was the way that they were going to be treated but it's very interesting the way that power plays out up there and you know perhaps i don't know what the reasons for that might be um but it's very clearly a problem that we have and it's not just in a in in politics like I, there lots of the work that i've been doing recently is around implementation science um, around how to implement change effectively. And one of the very powerful ideas that I've been using for the last five years or so, an idea that I borrowed from, from the health literature, is to use a vertical slice team. So instead of having all of the decisions made by a small group of leaders at the top of the organization, who are often you know very well qualified, intelligent, capable people, but because they are all the same essentially because they are all leaders because they're all so from that same strata that same subsection of society they succumb to group think right they, they they don't expose themselves to all of the all of the information and they they come with preloaded ideas and very capable highly intelligent well qualified group small groups of people who consistently made terrible decisions <laughs> over the years from the space shuttle disasters financial crashes um, the, the initial route work around groupthink was around decision making in the US around Vietnam wasn't it the Irving Janis work on groupthink um, and and uh, this top down thinking throughout societies we have senior teams in schools the NHS is run by senior clinicians and NHS directors businesses you know I'm sure that this comes up a lot in the work that you do and when you work with a vertical slice team when you have this cross sectional approach two things happen like number one you get much better decision making because you're looking at it from from every angle so in a school a vertical slice team would have like senior leaders middle leaders early career teachers the senko sometimes kids lunchtime supervisors you know whoever it is who's got some valid perspective on whatever it is that you're trying to to improve and it's not just a consultation exercise importantly where the, they, they sort of listen to all these voices and then just plow on with what they were going to do anyway they actually become the sort of the executive that's tasked with overseeing this particular aspect of school improvement. So A, you get much better decision making and B, you get buy-in because people throughout the organization can see that they are represented on this team. That there's somebody like them with whom they can interact throughout the change period. And, and people can see that it's not just the usual top-down stuff. 
Um, and I, I did a TED talk last year, a TEDx talk, where, where I argued essentially that we should have vertical sized politics, right? That instead of having this small number of people who are often like Nick Gibb is an accountant, isn't he? He's not, he doesn't have a background in education. You know, at the time, of, I think it was, was it when Sajid Javid was running the, the NHS and he was a former banker? And it's like, you just got this very small subset of, of cabinet ministers who who have power over these huge things that they have very little experience in. And instead of that, if imagine if we had a political system where there was a vertical slice at the top of the NHS, for example, that was run by a committee of people, including senior you know, doctors and nurses, but also junior doctors and nurses and hospital administrators and managers and health economists and patients represented, patients in social care represented, you know. Um, I don't think that we would have a social care crisis if, if people living in social care were, you know, able to to bring their experience to bear on the decision making. And I think that there's a there, there's a way that we could. This is all sort of going in a direction, and it's just taken a while to explain. But um, I, I had this idea as to a way that we could change the way that education is governed would be to to have essentially a select committee type organisation of, of politicians from across different parties who were involved in this select committee and each of them, let, let's say there was, it's, it wouldn't be called a select committee. Let's call it whatever the, 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 the education decision group, whatever it might be. Right. And then each of them could be responsible for a different aspect of education, early years, further education, assessment, whatever it might be, special educational needs. And then each of those people could be supported by a vertical slice team of people from throughout society who were in you know, bringing their experience to bear uh, be, because people sometimes say we should take the politics out of education and I don't think that that's ever going to happen I don't think there's anything more political than, than how we educate you know children and future generations but this would be bringing more politics in to the conversation you would have a much richer and more diverse and more robust set of processes to arrive at good decision making and you could recognize that there are ideological differences, but also that there are compromises and, and what have you to, that, that need to be made. Um, and you and you also review the data as, as time goes on and you continually orient yourself towards the optimal way, or if you like, the least bad way of doing whatever it is that, that you're trying to do. Um, it seems like it would be a, a good idea, but I don't know how you would how you would get from where we are now to where you you would have to have you know, Bridget Phillipson, for example, would have to come into power and then essentially give that power away, the power that she's fought all her life to gain, you know, and that seems to go against human nature. So I don't, I don't know, a little hazy on how we get from, from where we are to where we need to be, but I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that proposal. Yeah. Um, thank you, James. Uh, we need to have another podcast because that was so <laughs> rich and contained so much stuff. Let me just make a, a few very, um, uh, I think, um, uh, brief observations on, on what you've just said. If we go to Bridget Phillipson's and power, and you say give power away, um, I look at that differently. At least she's, she exercises her power in a different way. And she is exerting a different kind of power rather than the authoritative top down, you do this because I say so power. It's a much more subtle power and the power of true leadership. So that addresses that one. Interesting. And it'd be really great um, to revisit what you've just said in the last few minutes um, in the context of creativity. One of the things I said about creativity was creativity is based on saying, how might this be different of what we do now? I lost count of the number of instances of what we do now that you cited and suggested any number of how might this be different. That is creativity in action. Top down. How might that be different? Sorry, we do a slice. That's just one example. Mm. Instead of the boss saying, do this, we get people all the way through the chain. And that's what creativity is about. Your presentation, to want of a better word, your wise words in the last several minutes is just full and full and full of that stuff. Let's capture that. You also trigger in mind one of the just most piquant uh, missed opportunities of recent years. Let's wind back to March 
2020. Let us say we have an issue of saying, how do we give young people fair assessments of their time in school, recognising schools are going to be closed, and gosh, we just can't sit down at those sweaty desks in May. Just imagine a world where young people had got together in the way you described to say, well, you know, how would you like to be assessed? What do you think would be fair to you? And if that exercise had been carried out in March and April, I wonder what we would have ended up doing, which is another example of exactly what you're saying and a missed opportunity in space. One final point. Everything that you say is about power. And I'm going to back back to creativity. Given what I do, a lot of people say to me, what is the most creative thing you've ever come across? And depending on who's asking the question, they're expecting me to say, well, maybe it's Einstein's theory of special relativity, or maybe it's Pride and Prejudice, or maybe it's Monet's Water Lilies, or whatever it might be. So they're really startled when I say it's when you change your mind, especially if you are senior and in power. And I really mean that. The most creative thing anyone can do, in my opinion, especially if they're senior, is to change their mind because they've listened to what other people think, they've assessed the evidence, and they've come to a conclusion that maybe what they thought before actually is not the best possibility looking forward now, and it should be something different. But when you're in power, when you're arrogant, that's the last thing you're ever going to do, and everything gets stuck there. So it would be great to have a rich conversation around everything that you said, because there's so much wisdom in there and so many opportunities for doing things differently and indeed better. Mm. Thank you. That was a brilliant answer. And, and uh, I, I agree, we need, to have, we need to have further such conversations. Um, and we'll continue this at the conference, um, which will be coming out. Uh, so so th this episode should come out around mid-August this year. Right. And then, and then, so it'll be a month or so before the conference. And I look forward to, to, to meeting you in person then. But for now, I would like to say a huge thank you, Dennis, for taking the time to speak with me, to share your, your experiences and views. It's really interesting and important. I think that the work that you're doing around exams and grading, um, people should get themselves a copy of Missing the Mark. Um, and uh and get into this idea because it's like you say it's not really something that you hear very much about ofsted gets lots of headlines for all the wrong reasons off qual we don't really hear quite so much about so um yeah thank you for the work that you're doing on that front it's really interesting and important and um yeah thank you for for taking the time to speak with me well uh, my, my thanks to you james uh, it's been a delight to have this conversation which is totally unscripted um it was just a very natural and wonderful conversation and i think puts so many stakes in the ground for other conversations between ourselves and indeed with other people because the opportunity for doing things differently and better once there's a change in the power structure um now is a really really good time to go for that because there's enough time over the next year 18 months or so to bring some of the threads together and have a really powerful platform for beneficial change. So thank you very much.